This is faith. To walk where there is no path, to breathe where there is no air, to see when there is no light. This is faith. Hello all, my name is Maria Meredith and I am here to talk to Dr. Hossein Atiyeh about his latest book about Rahia Khanum. How are you? I am very well dear and I'm so glad that I had this chance to, to meet you and to be here and discuss this, uh, the book that we have recently uh, written with Mr. Hilary Chapman. Same here. Um, I really appreciated this book. I had a chance to read it. It was really great learning more about Rahia Khanum. And before we kind of get into details about the book, I just wanted to ask you, what made you want to write a book about this particular individual? Like, why not anyone else in our Baha'i history? Uh, I have a few reasons okay. to write this book. Number <laughs> one is uh, I was very close to Rahia Khanum because uh, she often would come to New York uh, in her major traveling. She was born in New York uh, originally in 1910. She loved New York. Uh, she would come here for shopping, for buying stuff for the uh, archive and others besides going to London. So uh, uh, and whenever sh she would be in New York, I would often be her drivers or her companion and take care of situations and arrange a meeting for her. So uh, I spent lots of time with her. So I really uh, became more of an admirer of this wonderful lady. That was one reason. The other reason is that the, I realize most people, especially young ones, and also my Persian compatriots, uh, they picture this uh, lady as an older woman who just traveled all over the world and teach the faith. Mm -hmm. I wanted to introduce her that she was actually very young, very vibrant, very assertive type of a, a person. And so uh, the whole first part of the book is dealing with her younger days and her childhood and her teenage days and what, what she did those days. So uh, we, we came across, uh, thanks to Violet Nachjavani's book, uh, Maxwell House, uh, uh, lots of correspondence between Ruhi Khanum and her mother. So we use that, uh, and I want to also sh share part of that stories with the friends. Uh, the focus of the book is, and, uh, is really to help the young people to appreciate the station of Ruhi Khanum. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that the, uh, because you know, we are living in such a fast uh, and, and on, going on and on uh, road, uh, we, we don't pay enough attention to some of these figures like her. Mm -hmm. And so I want to just bring it back again so folks would uh, realize what a wonderful lady she was and her contribution. I personally appreciate that you wrote this because, I mean, you know, when we talk about the equality of women and men, it's nice to have someone who has been highlighted, who's done such a wonderful, has made such a wonderful contribution to the faith. So I appreciate you just highlighting this amazing figure um, and the faith and just being a female, it's also just nice to have that um, bit of history brought to me. What was kind of something that was interesting that you found out about Rahia Khanum that you didn't know? Like what gem were you like, oh wow, I didn't know this about her, or, you know, something exciting and new? Uh, I knew a great deal about uh, her adult life, mm -hmm. but uh, I knew very little about uh, uh, really uh, the, her childhood and her teenage days. Mm -hmm. Then I realized her mother was a late woman by the name May Maxwell, who was a great Baha'i teacher. Uh, he, she was in love with Abdul Baha. Uh, she was residing in Paris for many years, and her home in Paris was really the center of all the Baha'i activity in the, in the continent of Europe. And many leading Baha'is came to the faith because of of her, Julia Thompson, Thomas Breckwell, Armstrong, and a whole bunch of others. She was a very close friend of uh, Phoebe Hurst, for example. Mm -hmm. And they even traveled together to Haifa to visit Abdul Baha in late, I think, 1898 or something. So, uh, May Maxwell uh, wanted so much to do teaching. Mm -hmm. 
and following the advice and instruction of Abdul Baha to travel and to teach. So often she would take off and goes around all over the world to, in order to uh, propagate this wonderful faith. So she would often leave Ruhi Khanum alone. And so I got a gut feeling when I read some of the correspondence between this mother and daughter that she was the young girl, Mary Maxwell, from the very beginning of her life, she uh, started to realize that she is in control of a household, for example. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in those days, there was no such thing. You take your laundry to laundry mat, you, do, you go to a restaurant to have a f food. You have, you, normally, in the, any household, especially rich people, which her family were very rich uh, in Canada, you had a housekeeper, you have a cook, you have a driver, you have a social dinners. Yeah. So the mother is away. So she has to be in charge of all this activity that normally an older person would take care of. Mm -hmm. This really uh, trained her for the rest of her life, that she became competent, uh, assertive, uh, no-nonsense type person. Mm -hmm. And you see in one of the co correspondence that she had with her mother, he said, dear mom, for example, I'm paraphrasing, uh, I had to fire oh. the so-and-so uh, mm -hmm. uh, for some reason. Yes. A young girl, 11, 12, 13 years old, is firing somebody for not doing a good job. Right. Uh, so she had to organize social dinner for her father, who was a very famous architect, actually, in Canada. These are the kind of things that I found about her. I found out, for example, that uh, at the age of, I think she was maybe nine, 10 years old, uh, the Tablet of Divine Plan was introduced uh, in actually in Hotel McAlpine, which was on 34th Street and 6th Avenue. She was one of the few girls who uh, uh, came forward, most likely she had the statement, was written the, uh, the particular prayers and instruction of Abu uh, and uh, along with some other young girls. So this was all new to me, uh, to, uh, you know, I picture her always as this wonderful lady that I, I drive around. But then realizing that she, she'd been around for so long mm -hmm. and she has done so much and uh, she was a native New Yorker. You know, she was born in a hospital called Fifth Avenue Hospital, mm -hmm. which later on became part of the Mount Sinai Hospital at, on, on 198th Street. So, I know for me, I thought it was really interesting to learn that she loved nature so much. Mm -hmm. uh, she loved animal. Mm -hmm. Normally, when you say somebody loves animal, you think of, a, oh, he, he, he or she has a dog or has a cat, but not her. She had a monkey. She had a parrot, she had a snake, she had a peacock, mm -hmm. she had a rat, mouse, and few other uh, animals. And she traveled with some of them yes, sometimes. I remember that in the exactly, book. yeah. So I, I, I remember in one occasion, for example, since I'm talking about my personal relation with her, that the, I got a message from her assistant, Violette, that uh, asked me, Hussein, do you know of anybody who's going to Haifa? Rui Khanum want to send something uh, uh, um, to, to Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And she just came back from uh, Amazon trip in Brazil. And they didn't tell me what she want to send, and I didn't ask. So I found out this young fellow, Persian guy, is going to Haifa. So I called him, and he got so excited that he's going to carry something for Rui Khanum mm -hmm. to Holy Land. So we are in TWA terminal in JFK, and uh, it's close to the time that we have to check in. And suddenly, these two wonderful ladies, Violet and Rui Khanum, they run through the terminal, and I notice, my God, they are carrying this huge cage with a parrot in it. And so she wants to send a parrot to Haifa, <laughs> and this poor fellow is supposed to carry the parrot for her. And you should see the expression on the face of uh, this young man. <laughs> and, 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 and she's giving him instruction uh -huh. that you have to talk to this parrot. This parrot is going to miss me. Uh, even if you have to go to the bathroom, take him with you, and this and that. And I think somewhere I have seen some picture of her uh, with that parrot. Uh, I hope uh, we can use it in our, our, our documentary. Uh, so then, uh, 
she's known for that. And when you go to Haifa, actually, to visit her house, there was, she had four or five peacock, and you walked in Abdul Baha's house, and you see all this beautiful peacock opening their, uh, uh, what do you call it? Tails. Tails and all that. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Fujita, that wonderful Japanese friend, uh, was her companion and take care of the, all the, this creature that she was holding in her house. I have lots of wonderful memory of this woman. And really, I, I, I wanted to uh, talk more about her personal life, but I, I thought that there is so much valuable stuff about her family, her contribution, and all that. that that's why. And I also want to give a credit to my good friend, uh, Hilary Chapman. Mm -hmm. Hilary Chapman is a, a grandson of uh, Leroy Iwas. Mm -hmm. A hand of a culture, I was, who was a special assistant to uh, Shoghi Effendi. So, uh, and we have been working on a number of books together, and this is our latest uh, uh, adventure. Uh, together. That's, that's, I love it. I love sure. it. How did you get access to the photos? And like, like what's a, what is it like to write a book about a human being? What do you do? Where do you uh, go? The, the, the secret is to find uh, uh, Tatiana Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have to have people in your corner. Uh -huh. You have to have somebody who is uh, talented, know how to do research, how to put material together. And really, we've been lucky throughout our publishing activity for the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. at, uh, even though uh, on the cover of the book is usually my name and Hillary Chapman, but there were others who did uh, lots of research for us. and and. Uh, Tatiana is very selective in what picture to find and where to find them, how clear they are. And, uh, uh, and so she, that, that's really her contribution as far as the picture comes out. Yeah, the pictures were really great. It was really nice to just see the correspondence. I like that, the pictures when she was a baby. She was, such, she was so cute as a baby. She was very cute. She was so yeah. cute in her she curly was... hair. Mm -hmm. Loved it. I loved it. Yeah, it was really great. You wrote this book because you wanted young people and youth to kind of know who she was and to feel inspired. Yes, it was very important for me, really, at this point. And I, actually, it was uh, so uh, it was such a good timing. When the book came out, a uh, number of couple of friends so far, they, off, they gave a substantial amount of money to our publishing house, which mm -hmm. is a Globe Press. Mm -hmm. And they offered to send a free copy, the Kindle version, to any youth anywhere in the world, uh, if they are interested. And we have been sending, Tatiana been taking care of that. We have sent many books already to uh, Uganda, to Australia, to South Africa, and many of to America. Uh, so all they have to do, uh, just uh, write to us and tell us why they want to uh, have this book, and we would send it to them as an e-book and as a Kindle version. That's, so, a, uh, so they save some money and they have access to this. Uh... Like when, I, I have to admit that when I, when I saw this book, I thought it was going to be a lot just about her. But you did a really great job of weaving in the history of the faith. You were also talking about, you know, giving explanations about parts of the world that she was in. So it was kind of not just a, a story about her, but it was a little bit of a history lesson. Is that your typical style when you write books, just to kind of incorporate different aspects of the faith and just life in general, or do you also sometimes just that's kind of a very good, about That's a very good observation, dear. Uh, 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 you know, for example, let me give you an example of what I'm thinking. Her marriage to Shoghi Effendi, mm -hmm. that the, uh, it was really a union of the East and West. Mm -hmm. It was a very unusual marriage at that time. person from a Persian background to marry this good-looking, charming Canadian mm -hmm. woman and, and all that. Uh, and, uh, you know, between her and her mother, uh, from the time of Abdul Baha, they used to be often going to Haifa to visit Abdul Baha and later on Shoghi Effendi. So I have a gut feeling that the uh, Shoghi Effendi began to be fond of her uh, earlier days. Mm -hmm. So I think it was around 1937, uh, that the, uh, when she was there with her mother in Haifa, uh, Shoghi Effendi's mother approached her. This is a typical Eastern uh, custom that the, uh, the proposal for marriage come from the family of the, uh, of the boy, the family of the girl. 
she approached uh, her, her May Maxwell and mentioned that her son, Sugar Fendi, is interested to marry her daughter. And I'm sure even this was a little bit of shock to her. Because how come Shokia Fendi doesn't tell me? Right. You know, her, his mother is going to tell my mother thing like this. But she so nicely uh, fit in that Eastern culture and Eastern setting. Because they, uh, it was not that easy for her. You know, it's a liberated, assertive, independent woman from Canada, a white woman, to go to, uh, uh, not, I shouldn't say backward. Backward country, those days, Palestine was not really that, that uh, much together, it was not Israel as it is now. And to easily fit with the family of Shoghi Effendi, with all this pressure that she was experiencing from her mother-in-law, her sister-in-law, and the rest of the Baha'is there. But somehow, she survived. Mm -hmm. And she became a shield and protector of Shoghi Effendi, because on later dates, when Shoghi Effendi was facing serious challenges by the covenant breaker, uh, including his own family, she was really there to, to help him and all that. So also another thing that is very important to realize, the kind of help that she offered to her husband, Shoghi Effendi. From the very beginning, uh, she became a, a kind of official secretary of Shoghi Effendi, answering all these corresponding and letters that was coming from all over the world. She was helping him to do research and work on different books. As you know, Shuk Effendi have written many books, and I'm undoubtedly Ruhi Khanum was part of all this research and work. Mm -hmm. uh, I give you an example, for example, during the Second World War, Haifa was attacked uh, by, by the German forces, and British was defending them because British was colonizing Palestine at that time. So there was a fight between the uh, Second World War going on in 1940s. At the same time, the Zionists were moving from Europe to Palestine. So there was a war and friction between the Arab and the Jews. Mm -hmm. Then on top of it, of course, there was a friction between the Muslim and Baha'is. And then there was a friction within the family of Shoghi Effendi. So this was really a trauma on top of trauma and trouble. But what amazing Shoghi Effendi did this, during this period, with the help of Rui Khanum, he began to work on the book called God Passes By, mm -hmm. which is a major, major historical work. And then uh, at the same time, uh, I think I should mention that uh, Rui Khanum's mother died, uh, I think it was 1940s, she, when she was seven years old in Argentina. Mm -hmm. so, uh, her father, Sutherland, moved from Canada to Haifa, and he was a great architect. So between her father and her husband, Shukri Fendi, they really began to design the Shrine of the Bab. Mm -hmm. And both of this, the book, God Passes By, and the shrine was ready, the model of the shrine, in 1944, 100 year anniversary of the declaration of the Bab. This was all her contribution. And and I think a uh, friend should read another book called Priceless Pearl, mm -hmm. which is the story of Shoghi Effendi written by uh, uh, Ruhi Khanum. Mm -hmm. And in that book, I think she described many of these things. She described how they married. She described uh, all the struggle of Shoghi Effendi. And then she described that this poor man uh, had the old fashioned typewriter and how much uh, you know he was bending over this typewriter and with the, with the finger typing all this magnificent work. You know, those days there was no Google to do the research and access to information and Amazon and LinkedIn and this and that. You have to do all this research and books and that. I, I remember I read someplace just to write the either Dawnbreaker mm -hmm. or the God Passes By. Shoghi Effendi has to read more than 200 books right. and collect the material. So uh, this was amazing that God works in a mysterious way. That the, uh, the Shoghi Effendi, I mean, Rui Khanum entered the life of the guardian of our faith. And between two of them, for the 20 years, from 1937 to 1957, when he, when he passed, uh, uh, it was a really, uh, wonderful marriage and very productive period of their life.
when I was reading that part, I just, I got tired just reading it. Because I just, like, it, it just imagine, you know, like, you know, with the computer, I remember, I remember when I was in school and we took computer lessons when it started and you would just touch the key and you'd get like 17 of one letter. So you had to learn how to be gentle because, you know, we were so used to typing hard. And so I was just like, the, I don't know, I was, it was quite inspiring actually reading this and to, to, to think about the work that they did based on what they had access to. It's, it was amazing. Yes, yeah, so I really appreciate it. And it's, it's nice to realize that when you're talking about a person it's, you can't always talk about them in isolation. You can't just say this was her life, but you have to see how it was because she was so integral to the part of the faith that you can't, you can't not help but give some history. So it was nice. A couple to... of cute things happened between the two of them. I don't know why I remember this. In one occasion, <clears throat> uh, uh, I think she wrote in one of the priceless pairs or someplace else, she passed by Shukya Fendi and uh, Shoka Fendi uh, uh, asked her, uh, what would you do after I die? Mm. You know, typical answer from a good wife or a good, is that, oh, sweetheart, don't talk about dying. You should never die. I hope I die before you, and thing like this. Uh -huh. And then uh, Shoka Fendi didn't wait for her to answer. He said, I assumed that you would uh, begin to travel all over the world right. and teach the faith. And this was really instruction to yeah. her, because that's exactly what she did after passing of Shoghi Effendi and a few years later, began her traveling and all that. In another occasion, they said the uh, Hanom had, was under impression, know that I'm doing so much for the faith, I have married the guardian of the uh, Baha'i faith, um, I'm doing this, this for sure, I'm going to make it to Abha Kingdom. So Shoghi Effendi turned to her and she said, uh, uh, don't, you know, simply because, I'm paraphrasing, you think, don't think because you are my wife or you have done this and, and you're going good anywhere. Uh -uh. Uh, your, your future and your eternal life is in the, in the palm of your hand. Uh -huh. uh, this, okay, the last thing I remember about the relation but it was cute, I thought. Uh, 1940, uh, her mother died in Argentina. And so a cable came to Shoghi Effendi that this has happened. So uh, he has to tell her. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he set up very nicely. And he said, do you know, Ruhiya, uh, uh, your mother was with God. Mm. Make up a story. And she was telling God all about you. She kept telling God, I have a daughter named Mary. She is so beautiful. She is so good, she is this, she is that, she can write well, she can give a talk, this, and God get tired of her, listening to her. So he sent her to Baha'u'llah. So, so, you, you listen. So she start all over again, bragging about her daughter. Oh, he's, she is so this and she is so that. Abdul Baha'u'llah sent her to Abdul Baha. And I said, Abdul Baha sent her to me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I have to act as your mother because your mother is dead. Oh, <laughs> it's kind oh of my gosh. the way she put it. And said, "Why well, no, she was laughing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so finally she got the message that uh, her, her mother is dead. Of course, sure, she was very upset. Yes. But I like the way that she conveyed right. uh, to her that uh, about her passing of That's her so mother. Sweet. <laughs> it sounds to me like you need to write a part two or do a podcast or something of all of the stories because mm. that's also really fun to hear that's very those true. interactions uh, yeah yeah the one thing that also part this you brought this up but i'm glad you uh -huh. you did this is what happened after the guardian passed and her how her life was because when you think about at least for me i don't know about for you but when i think about you know one her husband has passed grieving and just being sad and she was older she wasn't young and it's like a whole nother part of her life just started and here in the states when we were like oh i can't wait until i'm you know whatever age to retire so you can just you know sit back and enjoy life but then i'm reading this book and her life just kind of catapulted into this like non-stop just a, i don't know i don't want to say adventure but just this non-stop like whirlwind of a life traveling she has to you know can get the other hand of the cause together to get the universe off of like all of these things how did you feel 
and I'm sorry if I'm offending you, being an, a, an elder, <laughs> reading about this, did you feel like you wanted to start said, traveling take, and take, change your life? Maybe or... <laughs> take a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, what, what were your thoughts when you were reading this? I, it, it's interesting you say that. You know, when Shoghi Effendi died, she was, I think, 46, 47 years old. And, and his passing was quite unexpected right. because he was also a young man at the time. Yeah. And the expectation was that he would live much longer. And uh, the affair of the fate was uh, uh, pretty much on such a fast uh, moving forward. You know, mm -hmm. ten year crusaders was, you know, and all that, and planning, and pioneer, and night of whole law, and conferences, and all that. So uh, when they went to London uh, in 19, November of 1957, I think, uh, they went for basically do some shopping right. for the uh, buying some item for the archive. Mm -hmm. you now those who goes to Haifa and see all those beautiful item in archive when you open them and you see the tablet there, these are all the cabinet and stuff that Shoghi Effendi and her that did the shopping while just before he died. Unfortunately, there was a, a epidemic of Asiatic flu and then uh, he, he caught the, uh, the flu. And uh, on top of it, I think one night uh, he had a heart attack. So in the morning when she, when she approached her bed, noticed that the, her eyes, his eyes is half open. And then shortly after she realized that he, that he, he died. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a terrible shock, of course, to her. Uh, she immediately contacted, I think there were two handover calls. Uh, you see, by now she was also appointed as a handover cause, which was a major station mm -hmm. for the, in the Baha'i faith. Uh, she contacted Hassan Balyuzi and John Farabi, who were the two hands who were living in London at the time. Those are the two who right away find out uh, about the passing of Shoghi Effendi. Uh, and also she remembered or read about the, uh, the shock of the passing of Abdul Baha, uh, that the Baha'i world really went through such a, such a, tremendous, uh, unbelievable uh, uh, occasion. And she wanted to uh, not to repeat the same thing. So, so can you imagine somebody who just lost her husband also had to take care of this thing? Yeah. She First, she informed the International <coughs> Baha'i Council, which was a body of the people who Shoghi Fandi has appointed, I think nine of them. And she informed them that about his passing. Shortly afterward, not right away, she informed all the handover causes, I think there were 27 of them by then, that about died. Then a few hours later or next day, she informed all the NSS around the world that Shoghi Effendi had died. So, it would, and at the same time, she began the preparation for, uh, for his burial. She had to go around London and find a cemetery plot. Uh, and she, uh, uh, it was an amazing occasion, uh, his, uh, his funeral. More than a thousand people were present. Uh, and then uh, I think this uh, German uh, uh, hand of a cause, uh, Mr. Moschinger, was the one who washed the body of the Shoghi Effendi. And uh, uh, flowers were brought by Leroy Ivers from Haifa. Tarazullah Samandari brought something from the house of Baha'u'llah in Baghdad. Uh, uh, four hours of the, this ongoing things. It was a slightly a rainy day, uh, that occasion. And then and, and I read someplace that the, as she was leaving the cemetery or as while the thing was going on, she began to uh, imagine what, how the, his graveside would look like. And uh, she thought that the Shoghi Effendi always loved these Roman columns. Mm -hmm. And there was no place in Haifa that he could have used it, you know, with all the construction of different buildings. And then she was thinking of the, the worldwide uh, uh, adventure and teaching and expansion of the faith. And she was thinking of the role of the Shoghi Effendi in this whole picture. So she imagined those who've been in London have seen it, that there's a column right on top of the grave. There's a globe on top of the column, and then there is an eagle. On, on, uh, and that eagle was actually purchased by Shoghi Effendi himself 
from Edinburgh and he had brought it to Haifa and he was sitting in his office. Uh, he, he loves eagle, that particular powerful bird. So they brought that thing and they put it there. So this, this was the, uh, uh, I thought I shared with you the uh, story of uh, passing of Shoghi Fendi, and then of course, the, the, what happened later, also she was very instrumental. Uh, she and I think was four of them, they went to Haifa and they uh, sealed the safe uh, box of the Shoghi Fendi and locked the doors and then later, nine, nine hand of cars, they entered the room, unlocked the things, and they uh, searched all the document and paper to look for any kind of will and testament that they could not find. And then the whole group of them, they got together and they decided to form a, what they call it, a, a custodian. Uh, they selected nine hands that would reside in Haifa, and they would uh, finish the 10 years crusader plan and then they would help to form the Universal House of Justice, which happened in 1963. And that was also a special occasion. I, I have seen some video of that, that Ruhi Khanum opened the session and gave a talk and all that. So the, the history of really of this woman's life, uh, uh, by the time Universal House of Justice was formed, took a turn and that's a whole different subject that we can talk some other time about what did she do and her traveling and places she went and all that. 186 countries and territory she visited. She made some major trip, two, three of them to India, major trip to Africa, major trip among the indigenous people of Canada, Greenland, Iceland, major trip in South America, in Brazil and Ecuador and all that that eventually uh, she produced this famous movie called Green Light Expedition. Uh, she loved indigenous people. Even though she had the opportunity to meet with Mrs. Nehru, the Prime Minister of India, uh, she had the opportunity to meet Hala Selassie, the Emperor of uh, Ethiopia. She had the occasion to meet the Secretary General of the United Nations. But she always would say that her heart is in the countryside. Her love is with indigenous people. And you could see actually in some of the videos or some of her talk that she's giving in the, among the Indians in Ecuador, in the mountain area, or in uh, friends in Africa or in India, that the, she is at her, uh, uh, what's the good word? At her essence, at her best, mm -hmm. when she is with those people. At the, I remember occasion mm -hmm. that the, uh, the, she was talking about the uh, attendance to the feast, that the friends are so, in, the, in America, you say, it's 7.30, we should start the feast right now. Right. And if you are a few minutes later, what's wrong? Oh, you, it's getting late. He said, That's me. He said, in, Af <laughs> he said, in Africa, you wait one day for the next Baha'i to show up <laughs> because he's coming from a distant village. Right. Now, how you expect him to be here at cemetery? Right. <laughs> like this. Uh, so this, she wanted to emphasize the, the flexibility yeah. and, 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 uh, and the love that she had for those people. Yeah. Yeah, great great lady. I miss her a great deal, mm -hmm. seriously, because I have spent lots of time with her. I, I picture her as a, a really a modern Tahereh, that the, uh, you know, when we talk about the heroine of the faith, uh, we often talk about some good old days in Persia when Tahere took her veil off and she died for it. But when we look at the life of this lady and you can see the, uh, her contribution and her sacrifices and her uh, services uh, really even surpass what Tahere did. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is how I picture her as the really the ultimate heroine of the Baha'i faith in 19th and 20th century. That's how I look at her. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna remember that, the modern Tahiri. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. This has been really, really fun. I really appreciate I'm you. Glad to, I'm glad to hear that. It's wonderful. Me. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.